The first year after Pokemon's base set launched in Japan was chaos. Everyone was rushing to get a trading card game out the door, irrespective of quality, demographics, or budget. Very few people were asking why Pokemon was succeeding. They just knew that they all needed to have their very own card game on the market, and they needed it now. This is how we got Daikaiju Monogatari, The Miracle of the Zone, the Neon Genesis Evangelion TCG, Bandai's Yu-Gi-Oh card game, and the Shin Megami Tensei trading card game. None of these games were particularly good, and just trust me when I say that Evangelion is so bad I am actively trying to unlearn the rules to the game. However, in the mess that was 1997, there was one game that rose up above the rest to become an enduring favorite of Japanese tabletop gamers. Monster Collection. In the early 1990s, one developer dominated the Japanese tabletop gaming scene over all others, Group SNE. Founded in 1987, SNE made a name for itself by designing Sword World RPG. Inspired by early fan translations of Dungeons & Dragons, Sword World sought to simplify the mechanical elements of role-playing to make a rule system suited to the Japanese lifestyle. Rather than several weeks of intensive play sessions culminating in year-long story arcs, Sword World RPG was designed with small, self-contained vignettes in mind, where players would read the rulebook on the way to their session and complete an entire story in a single evening. Japanese tabletop gamers did not and do not have the kind of leisure time that American players did and do, because of long working hours and evening schedules being much tighter. Sword World, being made with this way of living in mind, became Japan's first tabletop RPG with mass appeal, and interest in it surged alongside the growth of so-called replay novels that rewrote session transcripts into entire books. Group SNE, in conjunction with their publisher Fujimi Shobo, had caught lightning in a bottle. But as time passed, interest in the tabletop RPG phenomena began to wane, and in the latter half of the 1990s, SNE began to explore other ways to diversify its retail portfolio. After observing the early popularity of imported Magic the Gathering cards and the domestic success of the Pokemon trading card game in October 1996, SNE's then overall director Yasuda Hitoshi collaborated with manga artist Mita Ryusuke of Dragon Half fame to create an original trading card game tailored to the tastes of Japanese adolescents and young adults. Reusing the setting and concept notes from their more obscure tabletop game, Monster Collection Fantasy RPG World, SNE conceived their trading card game as part of a new Rokumon Sekai, or Six Gates World, media franchise. Monster Collection was to be the root of a new phenomena spanning novels, TV, anime, and tabletop games, and after work on Monster Collection began, Yasuda even started making a Rokumon Sekai-themed expansion to the generic universal role-playing system, or GURPS, which SNE and Fujimi Shobo had published various Japanese translations of since 1992. That expansion would later develop beyond the scope of GURPS's system into the Rokumon Sekai RPG rules published in 2003. When Monster Collection finally hit store shelves in September 1997, it was an instant hit with the hardcore crowd, fulfilling much the same niche for Japanese adults that Magic the Gathering did for Western players. Mankole uses 50 card decks with up to 3 copies of each card allowed in a deck. Games take place on a 3x4 grid. There are 12 spaces in total, with you and your opponent both controlling a home base, or headquarters if you prefer, that you start from. You win the game by occupying the opponent's home base. Instead of a mana system, every space on the field has a level limit that determines how many monsters it can hold, with the home bases being 10. The combined levels of all monsters must be equal to or less than the limit. So on your base's 10 limit, you can have two level 5s, or one level 3, one level 6, and one level 1, and so on. Now, in order to move your party of monsters onto the rest of the grid, you first have to have a terrain card placed on the slot you want to move on to. If you don't have a terrain in place, you can instead place the top card of your deck face down as a proxy terrain. Most terrains, proxy terrain included, only have a limit of 8, which means that in general the power of a party on a proxy terrain will be less than the power of the party defending your opponent's home base. 
Existing terrain cards can be replaced so long as you have a unit on it or if there are no units on that terrain and it is adjacent to a space your units occupy. Even the opponent's terrain can be replaced if they don't have something on it to protect it. Each monster party can only cross one tile at a time, and doing so taps the monster. Unlike in Magic, in Monster Collection cards untap at the end of each turn rather than at the beginning. Although it should be noted that it wasn't called tapping at the time. You see, until it expired in 2014, Wizards of the Coast had a utility patent comprising the entirety of Magic the Gathering's rules and methods of play. This included the mechanical element of tapping and the use of the words tap and untap to describe turning cards horizontal or vertical to indicate an action. Contrary to popular myth, it was not tapping itself that was patented, because tapping is an idea and not an invention, and only inventions can be patented, but it was Magic's rules in their entirety, including card layout, reminder text, and the manner in which effects stacked that were patented. As a result, just having tapping and untapping and calling it by that name would not have infringed on the patent because to infringe, you have to contain every characteristic of the patented invention. And it should be noted that while Wizards had a patent in the US, they did not not have one in Japan, and patent law does not cross national boundaries. Thus, Japanese designers were in little real danger of facing legal action unless they started infringing on trademarks and copyrighted characters. In fact, the Shin Megami Tensei trading card game used the exact words tap and untap without repercussion. However, developers weren't always aware of these facts. The main thing was that wizards had lawyers and money, and game designers who did not have lawyers or money were afraid of them and did not understand the patent. Moreover, tapping was not always the appropriate word choice. In Magic, it came about to reflect the act of tapping into the mana within the player's lands, but in other settings it may not have made sense despite the familiarity of the terminology. Rather than try to figure out how to legally turn cards sideways and call it tapping, game designers came up with other words. And the word that Group SNE came up with was kanriol, meaning complete, as in movement complete. A unit in the complete position was unable to move or use abilities that required it to be made complete. Now, when a unit tries to cross into a terrain occupied by an opponent's unit, that's when a battle begins. The battle phase has four basic parts. First, the attacking player decides the order their cards will be damaged in. Second, the defending player decides their own order. Third, both players roll for initiative by each rolling a six-sided die, and finally, both sides deal damage to one another. The party that wins the initiative roll deals damage first, damaging their opponent's monsters in the order their opponent designated. Any monsters whose defense are less than the damage dealt are sent to the discard pile, and if any monsters remain after all damage is applied, they then deal damage back at the attacker. Some monsters have initiative bonuses that add a base value to the initiative roll, which is important because it doesn't matter how strong your opponent's units are if they never get the chance to attack in the first place. While the initiative idea is similar to the first strike mechanic introduced by Magic in 1993, it's real inspiration went all the way back to the initiative rolls of Dungeons & Dragons. Furthermore, each battle has an instant summon timing at the very start of the battle that allows players to summon certain monsters mid-battle. These monsters go away at the end of the battle but can provide enough attack power to break past the opponent's defenses. However, monsters summoned in this way are still subject to the level limit the party is on, and only monsters with their levels listed in black can be instant summoned. Spells are used only during battle, and in order to play a spell card, a player has to have enough spell icons shared across all units in their battling party to pay for its cost. For example, the Earth units Dryad and Trent each have one blue and one green spell icons, so they could cast one Grand Defensor and two copies of Water Shell, because Grand Defensor requires two green spell icons and Water Shell one blue. Spell cards are divided into two general timings. Normal timing spells can be cast by the turn player after initiative roll but before damage resolution, while counter timing spells can be cast in response to the opponent's spell or normal timing ability. Spells can actually be both timings simultaneously, allowing you to use them on either player's turn. Grand Defensor and Water Shell both have simultaneous normal counter timing. So in this example you could cast either of them at the start of the battle if you were the attacker, then another one in response to your opponent casting a spell or using a monster's effect, and the third card in response to their response. In this way, Monster Collection's rules promoted a higher degree of turn-to-turn -turn interaction than Pokemon did, and the fact that every party effectively had its own mana pool made going after specific monsters with a high number of spell icons important for maintaining your tempo throughout the game. Unlike in Magic or Pokemon, Monster Collection did not have separate main and battle phases. 
Because battle was a consequence of moving monsters into occupied territory, there wasn't any need to separate them. Turns in monster collection were instead divided into five steps. At the beginning and end of every turn, a player had a hand adjustment phase where they discarded any number of cards and then drew cards until they reached their maximum hand size. After the first hand adjustment phase of the turn was the main phase where they placed terrains, moved monsters, conducted battles, and played ritual spells. And after the main phase was the normal summon phase where they could summon monsters to their home base. After the second hand adjustment phase came the end phase where all lingering effects were resolved and play passed to the opponent. Note that there was no summoning sickness on units as there was for creatures in Magic. Instead, the rules simply placed moving and battling as happening before monsters could be summoned, and the very nature of the game ensured it would take two or three turns for either player to reach their opponent's home base, even with effects that let units move two spaces at once. In addition to units, terrain, and spell cards, there were also ritual spell cards and item cards. Only one ritual spell card could be played per turn, only in the main phase, and only if the player controlled a stone circle terrain, and many ritual spells were limited to one copy per deck by their own effects. Despite all of these restrictions, players were strongly incentivized to run three copies of Stone Circle and as many rituals as they could get their hands on. Some of the more powerful effects like Inferno destroyed all monsters on a specific terrain type, and the only way around them was to have monsters immune to their attribute like Fire Elemental or the spell Counter Ritual, which could be played on the opponent's turn to negate their ritual spell card and optionally copy its effect. One of the upshots of the card type was that rituals didn't require spell icons to cast, so they easily fit into any deck and could provide attribute coverage your deck didn't normally have, like letting you deal lightning damage through Call Lightning in a deck that only had water monsters. The downside was that, because ritual spells were essentially colorless, everyone was vying for the same cards no matter what deck type they were playing, which drove up the price of ritual spells in the secondary market. Every competitive deck needed three copies of Counter Ritual, Disintegrate, and Dispel, and many of them would also want to go all in on Teleport and Change Field. As a side effect of this, it also drove up demand for Stone Circle, but at least that was a basic card included in the starter set, while Counter Ritual was an uncommon. Monster Collection was relatively generous in that many deck staples were commons and uncommons, but there's no denying that power and rarity were connected, as the most powerful rituals like the board clearing and earthquake were invariably rares. Item cards were the final card type, and were further classified as either consumable or equipment items. Consumables were one and done effects where the card went to the discard pile after use, while equipment was continuously equipped to a monster and could even be passed on to other monsters later in the game. No matter what kind of item they were, to use them, you first had to have a unit with item slots to attach them to before use. The most powerful consumables were cards like Ceiling Tag or Crystal Ball that could negate effects or discard cards from the opponent's hand before they got a chance to play counter spells. These gave the turn player counters to the opponent's counters, but you couldn't completely shut the opponent down just by having them on the board, you had to plan out their use as part of an offensive play. Meanwhile, equipped item cards like Sylgian Boots or Ruby Ring gave the equipped unit additional spell icons, allowing them to cast spells they normally wouldn't across multiple turns, while still other equips would have unique effects, like how a frenzied war drum allowed its player to discard a card to change all dice rolls to 6 at initiative or counter timing. As a result of Group SNE's background, Monster Collection inherited several mechanics and forms of notation from tabletop RPGs. The most prominent was its use of dice rolls, which were all noted as number D, indicating the number of six-sided dice the player should roll for the ability. For example, the level 2 fire monster Zombie Eater had a main phase ability that allowed it to retire an allied zombie monster and in exchange deal the highest out of three D6 rolls to an opponent's monster. Like Magic and Pokemon, Monster Collection took certain steps to reduce the impact of variance on the game, just as Magic allowed players to redraw or mulligan their hand once at the start of the game but with one less card, and Pokemon allowed players to redraw until they had a basic Pokemon in hand while awarding additional draws to the other player in turn, Moncole's rules allowed a player with no unit cards in hand to reveal it, send all of their cards back, and draw a full replacement. Unlike Magic and Pokemon, theirs in the opponent's hand size wasn't affected by this, but it was only doable once per game. Moncole also took steps to negate the first turn advantage. Having the main phase take place before the summon phase already ensured a player couldn't move or battle on their first turn, but in addition to this, the player that went first did not have a hand adjustment phase or main phase at all on their first turn, thus preventing them from immediately filtering through their deck or casting ritual spells. All they could do was summon monsters and place terrains adjacent to their home base. 